All right, everyone, welcome to my series on random signals or statistical signal processing. We're gonna kick things off by talking about probability theory. Now, probability theory, it gets into some weird things like Borel sets, sigma algebra, measurable spaces, these sorts of things. Um, I'm gonna try to condense it down to the basics, but just remember that all this stuff is there lurking under the surface, and if you want more detail on it, either feel free to ask me and I can try to point you in the right direction on where to look at these things. Now, the basic of pro basics of probability theory here is that you start with something called a sample space. And that's what I've done here is kind of drawn this frame. And we usually denote this by the capital letter sigma, which is equal to a set of individual things that we call outcomes. So WI is an outcome. So in the case of coin flips, for instance, you could have a sample space that contains heads and tails, or you can, can imagine all coin flips um, of length five. So you would have heads, 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 tails. These are all examples of possible sample spaces. So basically what, you, what you're doing first to have probability theory, to be able to apply probability measures, like this has a probability of two or 20% or something, you first need to, of course, have what your sample space is or what your outcomes are in the first place. And what we call an event is simply a collection or a subset containing outcomes. So an event is a subset of big sigma containing outcomes. So you could imagine specific specific cases. Let, let me give you an example. So imagine I have an event A and I also have an event B here. Now, of course, we can have outcomes that are in A only. This could be like W A. And we could have an outcome over here, W B, that's in event B. And we can also have an event here. We can imagine this being W A B that lies in both the intersection of A and B. Now, one of the reasons we like doing it this way, um, notice how I haven't specified how many possible events there are. I haven't even decided whether or not this is discrete or continuous. This could be a, uh, a set where basically, you know, there are only a couple of different outcomes. There's, you know, two outcomes. Or you can have one where there's an infinitely many, an uncountably infinite number of outcomes. These are all possibilities here. We're once again trying to stay as general as possible. We can still come up with these probability theory axioms and things that are useful without needing to really specify what it is we need to, to talk about until we need to. And we often find that the proofs are easier the less specific we are, which is kind of counterintuitive, but we see this all the time in math. So we're just going to kind of roll with it in this particular case. Um, you can, of course, have the event, which is just the sample space itself, which is the, uh, you know, this, when we talk about events, we don't necessarily need to be, it to be a proper subset. So we're fine just allowing the event to be the set itself, which is really, really cool. Now, what makes probability theory so powerful and so important, and this is what we talk about when we talk about, hey, you know, I think this has a 20% chance of happening. Um, what we are basically say is each event has a probability measure. And this probability measure, what I'm gonna say is P of some event E, which is of course a subset of sigma. But once again, um, notice this extra line, it, does, it doesn't need to be a proper subset. And this needs to be, obey the axioms of probability. Now, this is a big word, but this is pretty much, th this, should, this should make sense when we start talking about it. Um, these are the three axioms of probability. Axiom number one, the probability of an event, of any event, needs to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, this should be the case, right? If I have, imagine I have a coin that's heads or tails, the probability that it lands on a donkey 
you know, I don't know, <laughs> something that's, you know, is going to be zero. So you can, you can have things, you could even say that's undefined. It's not in the sample space, but everything has to have a probability, but it doesn't make sense to say, okay, you know what? The chance of it raining tomorrow is minus 20%. You can say the chance of it raining, you know, giant pancakes from the sky or something is 0%. There's no way this is possible to happen, but you can't say it's like negative 20%. I mean, that just is nonsense. And I think that's what this first axiom is trying to capture. It's just, we're not going to have negative probabilities. That's just, um, that's just what we have. So, uh, let's, let's, let's keep that there. That's going to be important. The second axiom of probability is that the probability of the event that is our sample space, which of course is a valid event, is equal to one. So basically everything is captured that we care about in our sample space, there's really no going outside of it. So this is sort of like the big picture here, and then you can have events that are basically collections of individual outcomes, but all outcomes are contained in the event sigma, which forms our sample space. And last but not least, the third axiom of probability that is worth talking about here is if two events, A and B, are disjoint. So what I'm saying is if their intersection is the empty set. So basically what this means here is that A and B don't have anything in common. Um, then what we can say is the probability of a union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. So we can imagine here, and, and maybe maybe it's a better if I if I construct something else. So I have my outcomes B, and then I have I'm at, maybe this is my new set C, which is over here, which has some outcomes in it. The probability of B and C happening, if they don't have any outcomes in common that correspond to event B and C, is simply the probability of any event in, um, the probability of, of the event B happening, plus the probability of anything in, in C happening. So it's the kind of, this, this is the disjoint sort of conditions that, that we care about. So before going too much further, I want to talk about a few notes. Now, in general, a few notes notes. First of all, the probability of A and B happening, so A union B, if we look over here, is equal to the probability of event A plus the probability of event B minus the probability of A intersection B. And this is, of course, if you look at number three, um, if A and B don't have any events in common, then the probability of this happening is going to be zero and we get exactly what we expect. And what this is basically saying here is look at all of my stuff in A. The probability of A and B happening is this sort of, you know, it, what I would want to do is do this and let me do this in purple. Let's see if I can do it this way. Oh, here we go. Cool. So what we see here, of course, is this particular set of events. It's equal to the probability that A happens, plus then the probability that B happens. But notice how we double counted this section here because it's in A and B. So that's where we have to subtract the intersection of A and B. So those are the outcomes that occur because of A and B or the events that occur um, as a result of A and B both occurring. So that is where that particular piece comes from. This is just how you add two events together. Of course, if they are disjoint, meaning there are no outcomes or events that they share, then we can simply just add them together. The other thing that is worth talking about, and this will get us into Bayes' rule very quickly, is that the probability of A conditioned on B is equal to the probability of A and B happening, so the intersection of A and B divided by the probability of B. Now, what does this look like here? So the probability of A happening given that B has happened. So let's assume that we have some outcome, some, something happened, we have some event, and we know or some outcome happened that it belonged to event B. Well, 
one of the things what one of the things I can do to find the probability that that A happen conditioned on the fact that I know I now have knowledge that B happened. Well, this is simply equal to the basically the intersection of these two, which is of course going to be this purple part here in the middle divided by the overall probability of B. So basically what you're kind of doing is you're saying, I'm going to construct a new sample space now that I know that B occurred and my new sample space is now all of B and the event that I'm interested in is A happening given that B is now my new big sigma. So I'm sort of restricting my scope or in some ways, you know, zooming in to the event B happening and now restricting myself to this because I know that B happened. And as a result, we can use this to come up with Bayes' rule. So Bayes' rule, um, this was discovered or invented or whatever by Reverend Bayes. He was a Presbyterian minister who was responding to David Hume's On Miracles. And uh, Hume and Bayes actually, or Price, who wrote Bayes' rule up and was, was buddies with Hume, they were actually really close. So even though they were, you know, I guess they, I don't know if they disagreed, but um, they were, they were in contact, kind of fun, fun fact about, about those two, but obviously Hume very well regarded Scottish enlightenment philosopher and Bayes and Price also very well known and, and very influential people. One of the things that Bayes rule expresses is we say it like this, the probability of B conditioned on A is equal to the probability of A conditioned on B times the probability of B divided by the probability of A. Now, one of the things this is capturing is the probability of A and B happening. So this is A intersection of B is equal to, so that's this piece, the probability of A condition on B divided by the probability of B. So we can say, or sorry, the probability of A and B happening is equal to the probability of A condition on B times the probability of B. And we can do the same thing with A. So this is equal to, um, and then we can say is likewise, maybe I'll put it this way, the probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of A is equal to the probability of B conditioned on A. So then what you do is you basically say, hey, look, these guys are similar. We can relate them and then you get Bayes rule out of this. This is one way to do it. This I don't think this is the original way that Bayes and Price formulated Bayes's rule. I think they, they did it slightly differently, but this is going to be the way that is going to be the most useful for us when it comes to st statistical signal processing in theory. We're not doing Bayesian epistemology, at least not, not in these videos. So <laughs> well, we can have fun with that later. So this is Bayes' rule. And the last thing I want to say is an event, event A is said to be independent of B. And this is if and only if the probability of A conditioned on B is equal to the probability of A. And what this implies here is that, well, let's let's get to that in a second. Um, what's, what's going on here? Well, what this is telling you is that the probability of A happening, if you condition on the fact that B happened, so if I zoom in to B, and then I, and then I wanna know what the probability of A happening, basically what it's telling me is knowing that B occurred doesn't give me any additional information about A. Sometimes people think disjoint is independent. Like, oh, if I know that B happened, then A couldn't have happened. The reason this would not be independent is it, if I told you that B happened and you learned something about A as a result of B, that means A has some either dependence or correlation or something with B. Knowing something about B tells you some information, and, and I mean information in the sort of Shannon type of way about A. Um, for events to truly be independent, it tells you no information. Knowing that B happened tells you nothing about whether or not A is more or less probable than it was. It's just B happened. It doesn't let you narrow it down. It doesn't tell you its probability is zero. It doesn't tell you its probability is one. So it's really important to understand this distinction here between independence and disjoint events or events that aren't in, or outcomes that aren't in A or B. Of course, you know, 
events are subsets that contain outcomes, but you can have events within events as well. So it gets a little confusing. I guess each outcome could technically be its own of its own event um, because each individual item is is a is usually its own thing. So usually we talk about events, even though at the at the ground level things are made up of events, and then you just have sets of events corresponding to certain things. And a good example here is cards. So you can imagine each card being an outcome, but then you can have events like a hand that's a, I don't know, a royal flush or something like this. So a collection of these sorts of things, and you can calculate these probabilities. That's a, that's an example of events versus outcomes. So an event is said to be independent of B if and only if probability of A condition on B is equal to the probability of A. And this means if we look at Bayes' rule here, um, what, what, what we're basically saying is the probability of A conditioned on B equals the probability of A, which equals the probability of A and B happening divided by the probability of B, which then means that the probability of A and B happening, the intersection of A and B, is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. So in this particular point, you don't have to, you don't have any other particular factors that you have to account for. You simply multiply the individual probabilities because they are independent. If they're not independent, then you can't do something like this. You would actually need to factor in um, other terms based on conditional probabilities and things. So this is the, the very quick, quick and dirty intro to probability theory. In the next video, I will try to talk about random variables and what they are. Uh, plot twist, they're not actually variables at all. Um, they're mapping. So we'll talk about that in the next video. Uh, thanks for watching.